These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. The Sumerians had hundreds, perhaps even thousands of gods, but just as in earthly society, most of them were unimportant, and the greatest myths all focus on the top of the hierarchy. The great mass of unimportant gods were called the Igigi, the hoi polloi plebeians of heaven. Each of them was, of course, vastly better than any human, but they would be in charge of things like individual mountains, or they would be an individual's personal god or protector. Above the Igigi were some sixty high gods, the Anunnaki, or children of An, the venerable sky god. And among those sixty are about seven who are considered the highest and do the most of the stories, including figures we have already met frequently in the show, like Ishtar, goddess of love and war, Ea, god of wisdom and water, and the focus of today's story, Enlil, lord of wind and king of the gods. Now, Enlil's position has been a little bit vague in previous episodes because it was rather confusing to me just who was at the top of the Sumerian pantheon. And after some more intensive research, it turns out that the answer is simple and complex at the same time. The complex answer is that primacy among the gods shifted from place to place and from time to time, each city having its own principal deity, and indeed each person having their own personal god that they would usually communicate with, though only the most important humans would be taking the high gods as personal gods. The simple answer, however, is that while the most important or principal god would change frequently, there was, during the Sumerian period, only one king of the gods, Enlil, though to add a further wrinkle, he took that kingship from his father on during the early Sumerian period and would later be usurped in turn by the Babylonian god Marduk with the end of the Sumerian civilization. Enlil's city, too, seems to have had a special place in Sumer. Nippur was situated in the middle of Mesopotamia, along the Euphrates River and about halfway between modern Baghdad and the Persian Gulf. Cuneiform signs, like modern Japanese, can carry different readings for the same sign, and the town and god were so closely tied together that the sign for the two is the same, and the reading changes depending on context. Nippur was a major city, the equal of Lagash, Uruk, Ur, Kish, and the others we've discussed, but unlike them, it never held hegemony over the region. Rather, in the tradition, whichever city was able to establish itself over Nippur would be recognized generally as ruling all of southern Mesopotamia. This, coupled with the fact that we know of very few attacks on the city itself, suggests that it was something like the Vatican or Mecca of the Sumerian religion, a particularly holy site, and Enlil's temple the Ekur is covered with plaques recognizing the various kings who gave the city patronage. Unlike Ishtar, sadly, we have very few stories about Enlil principally. Rather, he frequently shows up in other people's myths to pass judgment or make commands. And so before we start the stories proper, allow me to read off parts of the chief hymn to Enlil that have survived to our time to give a sense of his power and prestige. Enlil's commands are by far the loftiest. His words are holy, his utterances are immutable. The fate he decides is everlasting, and his glance makes the mountains anxious. All gods of the earth bow down to Father Enlil and obey his instructions faithfully. The mighty Lord, the greatest in heaven and earth, the knowledgeable judge, has taken up residence in Nippur. With his power, the city permits no evil word to be spoken. Wrongdoing, violence, arrogance, impropriety, and egotism are abominations, are not tolerated within the city. He alone is the prince of heaven, the dragon of the earth, who determines the fates. No god can look upon him. His minister, Nunska, relays his commands to others and executes his instructions. Without the great mountain Enlil, no city would be built, no settlement, no cow pen, no sheepfold. Without him, no king would be elevated, no lords born, no high priest, no general, no captain. 
Without his leadership, the canals would not get dug, and the plants, fish, and animals that depend on the water would wither. Without the god of kingship, the natural order would collapse. Enlil, your ingenuity, takes the breath away. By its nature, it is like entangled threads which cannot be unraveled. Crossed threads the eye cannot follow. Your divinity can be relied upon. You are your own counselor and advisor. You are a lord on your own. Who can comprehend your actions? No divine powers are as resplendent as yours. This is not the whole of the hymn, but for all that it explains the scope of Enlil, I hope you can see why I have been so hesitant to read straight from these hymns on the show previously. I have removed as much repetition as I can, but seriously, why does the god Enlil need some human singer to remind him of his powers? And why does he need his ego stroked so much? I mean, I guess he isn't the only god with a fragile ego, so we can give him a pass on that. But in any case... We see him in his two principal aspects here, Lord of Kings and Lord of Fate. And for the Sumerians themselves, his very name means Lord of Wind, and so would have always been present in the back of their minds. As I said, Enlil tends to show up mostly in other people's myths, but we do have a pair of myths focused on him specifically. The two tales that are labeled as him obtaining a wife. You'll see why I say labeled as, because in the second one they don't even seem to get married, but the fact that he needs two tries is because ultimately he's pretty bad at the whole relationship thing, or at least bad by our standards. Honestly, the Sumerians seem to be celebrating his ineptness, though I don't know. I guess he gets married at the end. Uh, so I guess he's pretty successful by Bronze Age standards. In any case, the first is called Enlil and Sud, and it opens with a beautiful woman sitting in a plaza in Uruk. This woman is compared favorably to a cow for her childbearing and childfeeding properties, which makes her admirable and full of charms. This flourishing beauty is, of course, the mortal woman Sud. Now, in these days, Enlil had no wife, and he was on the prowl. He had searched through Sumer and the entire universe, and had just stopped into Uruk for a quick break, when he spotted the woman of his dreams just sitting there. He was not the least bit shy, though he was very enthusiastic as he approached her there without warning. His pickup line was, I will make you perfect in a queen's dress. After standing in the streets, you will become a god. I am impressed by your beauty, even if you are a shameless slut for standing around in the streets looking like that. The scribe of the tablet ascribes the fact that she did not fall head over heels in love with him immediately to the fact that she was youthful and inexperienced. I would instead ascribe the fact that she didn't slap him right there to her dignity and poise. She responds with outrage, saying that she has every right to stand at the gate of her own house and that this stranger has no right to give her a bad reputation. She asks accusingly what his intentions are, since apparently she was frequently hit on, and seemingly by other men with no more tact than the god of kings. Enlil steps closer to her, completely misreading the situation, saying, I just want to talk with you about becoming my wife. Kiss me and I will let you think about it. But he'd barely finished speaking when she'd fled into the house and locked the door. Good for you, Sud. Well, though Enlil, Lord of Wind and Decreer of Fate, certainly had the power to burst down the door, he is, for all his creepiness, not a rapist, and so he calls his minister Nuska. As a quick aside, he is the one who decrees people's fate. It's rather vague about how specifically he determines a person's fate, but from our modern perspective, my first question is, why did he not just decree Sud's fate to be to marry him? But it turns out that nowhere in surviving Mesopotamian documents does anyone bring up the questions of free will, so very common in modern philosophy. 
It isn't that they believe they have an answer and just don't think it's worth arguing about. Rather, it seems that no one ever really thought about it. There was destiny, it was decreed by the gods, and unknowable in both content and purpose. And anyway, destiny or not, you did your duty every day because you would either starve or be punished, and destiny would just work itself out. Sumerians, in general, seem to have had a very pragmatic temperament which exacerbated their lack of philosophical foundations. Anyway, the minister, Nuska, is given a message and told to go to the house, and he knocks on the door. Since he's coming as a messenger, he's invited in politely to meet the head of the household, Sud's father. And Nuska says, The god Enlil, lord of wind, would like to have your daughter as a wife. Give your consent. I will offer many presents in my name, and offer presents to your daughter, like this jewelry I've brought with me as an example. Your daughter will become Ninlil, Lady of the Wind, sharing in Enlil's divine power. And for you, I will make you and your city of Uruk rule over all the people of Sumer. Sud's father bowed his head greedily, saying, Oh, sacred minister, let your god know that I'm always his humble slave. After all, who could reject all the gifts you're giving me? I will inform my daughter that she is being sent off for marriage. By bringing me these gifts, the insult is just wiped away. And he went and woke up his daughter and instructed her to say polite praise to the minister and to accept the marriage. And she did as ordered. Well, Enlil was thrilled by her father's acceptance and through a huge wedding feast with all sorts of delightful foods, every sort of animal, fruit, and dairy product was cooked up, and gold and gems were brought from all corners of the land. With the wedding, Sud became the goddess Ninlo, or Lady of the Wind, and she was also given command over the growing of grain and digging of canals. And there the story ends. Now, I've been reading a lot of academic study of Sumerian myths recently, uh, I've been doing, in fact, a fair bit of study for this show and learned quite a lot since starting this project. But the professor asserts that while the Sumerians wrote literature, the idea of literary climax simply hadn't been invented yet. And the more I think about it, the more it seems right. I've been trying to impose normal literary conventions in these stories as I go through it, but so often they just sort of peter out like this one, where the action's all front-loaded, and the whole ending just sort of trails off. It is interesting to think that narrative structure was something that had to be invented, and that there are a thousand years of literary works that predate even the most basic of structures. But the lack of climax is not the only interesting thing about that story. Also of note is that it isn't the only story of Enlil getting married. In fact, it probably isn't even the principal one. For the Sumerians, the point of that entire story I just told you is almost certainly just the one line in the middle where Sud's father, a man of Uruk, is promised supremacy over all the land, a sort of mandate of heaven for the periods where Uruk was dominant over Sumer. The other story takes place in Nippur, Enlil's holy city, and features a similar opening but a vastly less ethical plot. It is, however, a more developed story in its form, opening the story with a setting of the scene to explain to us where the events are about to happen, and having a bit more structure than the last. There was a city, the one we live in, Nippur, opens the tale, before naming the rivers and locations and distances between them. Enlil was one of its young men, and Ninlil was one of its young women. Nunbar Shiganu was one of its wise old women. A good start. The girl Ninlil is heading outside when her mother Nunbar Shiganu stops her, saying, oh, Don't go out to the river to bathe. Don't even walk along the riverbank. Lord Enlil watches that river. He determines destiny, and his power is unbeatable. And if he sees you, then straight away he's going to want to kiss you and he is going to want to put a baby in you, and then he will leave you. But Ninlil wanted to bathe in the river, 
and trusted in the goodness of the people and the gods that no one would take advantage of her while naked and vulnerable. But while she was bathing, she looked back, and all of a sudden there was Enlil watching her, getting closer. When he got close, he said, I want to sleep with you. But she didn't let him. Another great pickup line. Then he said, I want to kiss you. But she still didn't let him. I'm too young, my lord. I don't know anything about intercourse, and my reproductive organs are still immature. And frankly, if she's too young to get married by Sumerian standards, then we are well into Prince Andrew territory here by our standards. Since his creepy pickup lines had failed again, he again calls his minister Nuska to assist. Nuska, he says, do you think anyone has slept with a maiden as young and lovely as this one in all of history? Fetch my boat. And Nuska holds his tongue, presumably because, no, he doesn't think anyone has slept with quite so young a child before, but he obediently gets the boat for the child predator god. Enlil hops in the boat. He is so excited, and he repeatedly exclaims his excitement that he's actually going to have intercourse with the youthful object of his desire, saying it over and over again to the hopefully embarrassed Nuska. They then come across the spot in the river where Ninlil is still bathing, having apparently decided that she was safe when the creeper left. And as the boat speeds past, he plucks her out of the water, throws her on the floor of the boat, violates the child, makes her pregnant with the god Suen, and leaves. After that, Enlil is walking around downtown Nippur, strutting like he owned the place, which he did, and generally feeling like he was on top of the world. When, quite by surprise, the fifty Anunnaki, the high gods, including all seven of the great gods, excluding Enlil himself, obviously, surrounded the Lord of Wind and charged him with the high crime of rape. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty great, says the king of gods, but the other gods are not impressed by his defilement and banish him from his own blessed city, where no crime or impurity can be tolerated. Faced with the combined might of all the other gods, he's forced to comply with the law and leaves Nippur. And Ninlil chases after him. Now understand her situation here a bit. Rape is bad for sure, but in ancient Sumer, her life has been so ruined that it's really hard to understand. You see, a woman only really had three stations in life, daughter, wife or widow, and Ninlil has been ruined for a decent marriage. And the same cultural disgust for non-virgin brides that permeated the culture probably also filled her own heart, burying her in guilt, shame, and self-loathing on top of the normal pain of being victimized. She has basically no good options here except to pursue Enlil. She needs him to take some sort of responsibility, or she's going to be consigned to poverty and disgrace her entire life. And so Ninlil reaches the city gate and asks the gate guard if he's seen Enlil. The guard says, Enlil? You mean the great king of gods? No, I haven't seen him anywhere. What Ninlil doesn't know is that the gate guard is actually Enlil in disguise and says to him, I must find him. He's violated me, and I need to pursue him. Well, says Enlil, disguised as the gate guard, maybe I remember something. Could there be something you can do for me to jog my memory? What? Ninlil cries, outraged, but the guard continues. I mean, it isn't like you're a virgin anymore, so if you put out once, you could do it again, right? Besides, how else are you going to find him? And so, she's forced to submit to the man and becomes pregnant with a second baby, the god Nurgle. The gate guard then tells her that Enlil was heading to the underworld. So Ninlil reaches the edge of the river of the underworld, still seeking Enlil, when she meets the master of the river and asks her where her violator went. Again, he plays coy, demanding physical payment, and again, it's not the master of the river, but Enlil tricking her again to violate her further. 
When she is again forced to submit, he gets her pregnant a third time. Note that she still hasn't given birth yet. They're all just piling up in that womb there, and is told to find the ferryman to take her across the river of death. So Ninlil reaches the ferryman, the precursor to the Greek Charon, except that he too is actually Enlil in disguise. The sequence repeats itself and Ninlil is violated a fourth time. And then the story ends with the moral. The moral, as far as the Sumerians were concerned, was Praise Enlil, king of gods, for being powerful, virile, and for being way cleverer than that silly Ninlo. Actually, taking these two stories together, it seems likely that after the fourth time, he just abandoned this woman in the land of the dead after her four baby gods were born and then took Sud as Ninlo, which is really just a title meaning Lady of Wind. It would have been considered a happy ending 4,000 years ago, since Enlil can claim a victory here, though it clearly does not seem that way nowadays. This tale, while dark, tells us more than perhaps we would like to know about the outlook and daily life of the Bronze Age. But I don't want to end the show on a down note, so let's look at some of the stories about the Lord of Wind in which he isn't being a serially raping child predator. The three remaining that are about him principally, not just another god with Enlil being present, show a very different side of him. Enlil is, after all, one of the seven chief gods capable of creation, and perhaps highest among his inventions is the hoe. And we have, very well preserved, a tablet called the Song of the Ho, which is remarkable for being perhaps the oldest recorded pun in human history. It is not the pun we would make on the word ho, and the pun is sadly completely untranslatable, but it hinges on the fact that the word for the agricultural implement, al, was a common syllable in longer words, and so the song repeats the sound al many times. The song tells us that the god Enlil formed the universe in its correct form, then separated the heavens from the earth. This is pretty foundational to Enlil's character, since it is wind, the atmosphere, that stands between heaven and earth and holds the two apart. He did this, apparently, with the help of the Ho, and thus created daylight, during which time men can work with the Ho. Now Enlil's Ho was pretty great, made of gold and jewels, and he was so proud of his invention that he put a crown on it and named it the King of Tools, useful for everything. Now, here in the land of mortals, Enlil created humanity out of clay, clay he gathered with his hoe. The other gods bowed before him, there's a, another Sumerian pun there, and then they created human reproduction, which has another hoe pun. Then Enlil farmed them all into rows based on how valuable they were, valuable being another pun, and then gave them all hoes so that they could get to work. His temple in Nippur, the Ekur was founded by the Ho, and the temple was fed with farmers who use hoes. The Abzu temple was also built with hoes. Then, when the temple of Ishtar, the Ayana in Uruk, was in disrepair, the Ho cleared out all the rubble and weeds and made it clean again. Even the gods used the Ho in their building projects. When the Sumerians conquer foreign lands, they teach them how to use the Ho for farming. And when those lands rebel against the god who created the Ho, they are destroyed by the power of storm and dragon, both of which are also puns on Ho. When all the land is made better by the Ho, the gods rejoice. Even at the end of life, the Ho buries the dead, and if the gods wish to bring you up again, they will use the Ho. Even Gilgamesh was proficient in the Ho, as well as the Or, another pun there. All the great tools of humanity have the sound of the hoe in them. The battle axe, the net, the bowl, the sled, the closet, because the sound al, the hoe, is so sweet. The hoe makes everything prosper and flourish. The hoe is good barley. The hoe is brick molds. The hoe made humanity. The hoe built cities. It cultivates land and buildings and destroys weeds and uneven land. It is the hoe whose destiny was fixed by Father Enlil. 
Songs obviously lose a lot in translation, as of course do the puns in the song. But not only did Enlil create the hoe, he also created grain. Except that he put all that grain deep in the mountains where it was hard to get at. So in the story, How Grain Came to Sumer, two brothers decide to go up into the mountains and bring it back to Sumer. The more devout brother complains that this would go against the command of Enlil, king of the gods, and that it would be inappropriate to upset the natural order by introducing foreign crops into Sumer. The first brother says that they'll go down to Shamash, the sun, while he is sleeping at night and enact a plan. But what is that plan? How does it turn out? No one knows. Only the opening of the story survives. Similarly, we have the short story of Enlil and Namzantara that survives, but it is so brief and cryptic that I hesitate to even include it here. And so the last of the Enlil stories that still survives is actually one of the seven debates from the wisdom literature. These are seven dialogues in which two elements of the world or nature are compared and it is determined which is better than the other. Today we have the debate between winter and summer. Enlil was in the process of creating the world one day when he realized that the world would be better if there was a season for lengthening days and another season for increasing the amount of water in the rivers. Why he wanted these things in particular, I can't say. But needless to say, he went and impregnated the hills and gave birth to two gods, lordly winter and heroic summer. The job for summer would be to found cities, to harvest grain and work fields, while winter's job would be planting and the spring floods. Both winter and summer worked hard at their jobs, and then after a year it was time to bring offerings for a holy day of Enlil. Each brought their produce, summer with animals of all sorts and animal products, but also beans and vegetables, and most importantly, huge stacks of grain. Winter arrived with all manner of quartz, gold, and silver, fine woods and dried fruits, an assortment of winter crops and wild game. And when the two were setting up their tables, Winter felt the ache of his arms from the work of planting and watering and plowing, and he just couldn't continue. Instead, he snapped at Summer, saying, You need to quit looking so smug. You may get to harvest the grain, but don't act like you had to do all the hard work. How much of my toil is sitting there in your section? Winter continued to taunt Summer rudely. Summer, the great hero, searched for rude insults himself, and he was confident. Like a great bull eating rich grass, he raised his head. Winter, you may stay with the oxen, but you should not launch such insults against someone as active as me. For all you work tilling the land, you never spend time at the temples or caring for the house. The scribes abandoned their scribing for the fields in your time, and no one plucks rushes for the beds. My power is so great that my term is seven months of the year, while you only need toil for five. And tirelessly, I place abundance in the fields. I pile up fish in the waters and still have time to repair fences around the fields. Your insults simply are not becoming of you. Summer, you are like the bragging field worker who doesn't yet know the size of the field. You boast about how my efforts fill your granaries. Though you've gathered all things in the land and filled the storehouses, in all my strength, I am their owner. When you put the plow into the barn, you get to sit with plenty of food and drink, with the choicest goods in the land, and you can prepare the finest offerings for the gods, but it is I who made all that. And more, I safeguard the people from the oppressive heat of summer and sweeten the beer with cold water. Ah, but winter, you make the people's teeth chatter as they dash from warm fire to warm fire, never comfortable. And when the day is half done, already the streets are empty, and the servants sit by the oven until sunset, neglecting the housework. Those who work in winter are hasty, 
and don't plow the furrows straight and drop the seeds too shallow to get eaten by birds. The laborer in winter is made slow and lame by you. The two gods planted their legs and stared each other down like great bulls about to charge. Winter looked up and gave praise to Enlil, who was still watching, saying that because of him, the granaries were filled while summer is boastful but lazy. Summer then calls to Enlil, praising the god as well, and Enlil looks down at the two of them. The Lord of Wind says, Winter is the controller of the life-giving waters of the lands, the farmer of the gods who produces everything. Summer, how can you compare yourself to winter? And with Enlil's verdict given, it is written into the fabric of the universe. Summer gives submission to winter on Enlil's orders, and the universe is back in harmony. The Sumerians were great arguers, and these disputations form one backbone of Sumerian philosophy, and so great stock is placed in written laws and authoritative judgments. Taking this role as chief among the gods is usually the most important aspect of Enlil, above and beyond his lordship of the wind, his creative power, and his creepy relationships, although it can seem minor when looking at it as we do from the window of myths and legends rather than the actual cult practices of 4,000 years ago. In any case, next week we're going to continue on our look at the great gods, but this time with someone a little more conventionally exciting. One of Enlil's sons, god of farming, hunting, and war, Ninurta is one of the great action heroes of Sumer, rivaling Gilgamesh for sheer heroism. So join me next time as we quit pondering all this philosophy and ethics and simply punch our way through problems with the god Ninurta. Thank you for listening.